A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, what does Scripture say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. For the scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, enriching all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And salvation we might equate with eternal life. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To know Jesus is eternal life. How are we to know Jesus if we don't find him? We must find this Jesus in order to know him. But where can we go to find him? Parting for a moment on this search for the divine, Moses reflects in the book of Deuteronomy on the transcendence of the divine communication which came down at Sinai. And he says, For this command which I am giving you today is not too wondrous or remote for you. It is not in the heavens that you should say, Who will go up to the heavens to get it for us and tell us of it, that we may do it? Nor is it across the sea that you should say, Who will cross the sea to get it for us and tell us of it? that we may do it. Paul interprets this same passage from Deuteronomy in the verses immediately prior to today's reading from the Romans. He identifies Jesus Christ as the Torah incarnate, restating these very same questions, not in terms of the commandments of the law, but in terms of Christ himself. So then, The question still remains, where do we seek God? Where do we seek Jesus Christ? Do we go to a holy site? Do we go to a monastery? Do we climb to a mountaintop? Well, if you took a pilgrimage to a holy site, say Lourdes or Mount Athos, it would be certainly a fruitful trip. And the sacrifice that you would make would certainly help dispose you towards your receptivity to God. Plenty of places God himself has consecrated the very location by his divine activity in what he has done there. But not everybody can afford a plane ticket to get the Lord's. And not everybody can make the trip due to reasons of health. So, how about a monastery or a mountaintop? Well, clearly... Not everyone is called to religious life. Um, We'd be bursting at the seams if everyone who was here this weekend suddenly joined tomorrow. Um, But still, not everyone is called to that life. And mountaintops, mountaintops can be treacherous, even for the most athletic among us. Yet Paul assures us that God avails himself to all without exception. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, enriching all who call upon him. What options remain for us if we can't scale the heights or cross the seas? Paul reminds us, what does scripture say? He asks, the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Through the gift of baptism, God has sent the Holy Spirit to us, into our very hearts. We have no further to travel 
than our very selves. What then are we to make of monasteries and mountaintops? Well, these are places without distractions, places of silence, places which by their very nature beckon us to refocus our thoughts and our attention on God, in whom our ultimate happiness and our ultimate end alone lies. These are places where external obstacles to prayer are removed so that our mind can be stilled and we can wait patiently for the voice of God to come to us, to tell us sweet whispers of loving right into our ears. These walls, this life that we all live, they help us to do that. But they are more like the Sherpas that guide you up the mountain to the summit than they are the summit itself. The the true monastery that we need to enter then is our very own heart, the cell of the self, as St. Catherine puts it. And as Lent is a time for turning back to God, for reprioritizing where and how we make use of our time, I would like to suggest that at the end of this reflection, especially for those of you watching on our website, preachingfriars.org, that you take just three minutes of prayerful silence to be with God. Stay in your chair or on your couch. Turn off your iPad, turn off your phone, kill the power to your computer monitor, and close your eyes. Imagine yourself walking on a path to a monastery door. Let your thoughts roll by like passers-by. Look over their shoulder. Let them go by, but look over their shoulder at the door. And pay attention not to the door, but what lies on the other side. And listen patiently for his voice. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will enter his house and dine with him, and he with me. <laughs>